Now I want to read you, first of all, a passage from the second book of Samuel, chapter 9. The second book of Samuel, chapter 9. And we're breaking into the most moving portion of the Old Testament, at least to me. And it's the story of this lovely, lovely man, after God's own heart, David. And David is to be taken invariably as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that's designed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus came in the line of David and his forefather David foreshadowed him in so many matters. And then at last, after many tears and troubles, David has come to the throne that God promised him. And he had many years fleeing as a fugitive from Saul, the first king, who was so jealous of him. But Saul is slain in battle, as is also his son Jonathan. And the people have acclaimed David as their king. And his first act was to say this. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And the rest of the house of Saul, a servant who is known as Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lying on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Judah said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mashur, in the, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Lodabar in Hebrew simply means no bread. It's very significant that this man was living in a place called no bread, hiding there for fear. Perhaps starving almost. Now then, the, the, <coughs> then David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mashiach, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now then the Pugashef, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, the Pugashef, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to his evil soul servant and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son, all that pertain to Saul and to thee all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son has food to eat. But the Phibosheth thy master's son shall eat bread continually at my table. Now Ziza had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziza said unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant be. As for the Fiddlesheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And the Fiddlesheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all the girls in the house of Zebra were servants of the Fiddlesheth. So the Fiddlesheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. And so we have just read of a table at which David was head, and at which the only remaining descendant of the house of Saul, which had so persecuted David, was given an honorable place. Now having read that story, the story of the table of which David was the head, I want to tell you to
to another story. In a few chapters before, it took place years before, the story of another table at which Saul was head. When Saul treated David very differently from the way in which later David was to treat his only descendant. All right, then we turn back to the first book of Samuel, chapter 20. Here then is the story of the table of which Saul was head. We go into the story. David is a fugitive. Verse 24 of 1 Samuel 20, 24. So David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. And the king sat upon his seat as of other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day, for he thought something must have fallen him. He was not clean, surely he is not clean. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Therefore, for cometh not the son of Jesse to eat meat, neither yesterday nor today. And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore, he cometh not unto the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, who said unto him, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established in thy kingdom. Therefore now, send them fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain that will be done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. And so that's our subject for this evening. Two tables. Two banqueting halls. The first one is the table of which Saul is the head. And the second, that of which David is the head. First of all, the story, what a story this whole thing is. The story of the feast, the table, at which Saul was head. I must give you a little bit of the background of the story. I trust you will be interested, because there's no stories like these Old Testament stories. They're terrific. Saul, you know, was God's first king, was Israel's first king, and Samuel anointed him to the king over Israel at God's command. But it was an understood thing that Saul was to be king only under God. He was not to be a king in his own right, simply God's vice agent over Israel. But it seems that Saul never understood that. Perhaps he never wanted to understand it. Because it's quite obvious he assumed but now he was king, he was king in his own right. And this was made manifest when God gave him various commissions to carry out. And Saul chose how far he would obey God. When the king came, Saul, then he would obey God, but no further. And in various matters which we won't go into now, Saul transgressed the commandment of the one who the feet was his rightful king. And in so doing, he violated the whole terms of his appointment as king over Israel. With the result that God sent Samuel to Saul with that solemn, solemn message, because thou has rejected me, I have rejected thee from reigning over Israel. He said further, I have rent the kingdom from you, sir, and I have given it unto another, a noble of thine, who is better than thou. 
And so he said from that day, where he continued to reign as king, was nonetheless pronounced by God as an objective king, and told that God intended to take the way of the kingdom to give it another to another, and of course that other was David. Now the fact that Saul was the rejected king was the fact that Saul would never accept. He didn't quite know who the neighbor was, but they decided that neighbor would be to the poor. He was not going to accept himself as the rejected king. He was not going to step down for anybody. And so he had years in which he still, after this ban upon himself, tried to be king. And here in the story, you see him as king sitting at the head of the table. Now that's the story of Adam, and it's the story of you and me. Right, so we have uh, been anointed by God to be king over the territory. Everyone has been anointed by God to be king over some territory. If you're a father, you've been anointed to be his king over that family. If you've got some sphere of influence and work, you've been anointed to be king over that sphere. If you've got some piece of service, he's anointed you to be king or queen in that particular territory which he's given you. And if it doesn't seem that God's given you any territory to rule over, he's got one certain he has, and that is the territory of your own personality. He's anointed you to rule that life of yours for him. But it's understood that in anointing us to be king, we are kings only under him. He is the king of kings. In actual fact, we are nothing more than his vice regent. That was how God arranged things for our first father Adam. He wanted to be king over the whole of the earth. To read it from God. To be God's vice regent. But the fall for Adam consisted that he took it into his mind that he was to be king in his own right. And he chose how far he was a day, showing that in his final analysis he was, had decided to be king rather than God. And our first father, Adam, violated the whole terms of his appointment as king of God's creation. And what's happened in Adam's life has happened in each one of us. It certainly happened in mine. I've been anointed king over this or that territory, but I have to confess, I violated the whole terms of my appointment again and again. I've considered that I'm a king in my own right, that I can do what I like in that, that sphere and opportunity. I'm not God's vice regent. I make the final decisions. And because that's been your attitude, and it has, it's been pretty obvious, hasn't it? You people get the impression in home or elsewhere that you're only carrying out God's orders. You're only a vice regent. You may not see self rearing itself up and reacting and resenting as if the wrong done to down has been done to you while you run you represent of course we've all done this we've all violated the terms of our appointment and so as with Saul so with us there's a sense in which God says because you have a, re rejected the word of the Lord I also have rejected you from reigning over Israel I'm going to take that territory which I gave to you, to you, to me, in which you proved such a complete failure, and I'm going to rend it from you, and I'm going to give it to a neighbor of thine which is better than thou. You say, what on earth do you mean? Who's giving you a neighbor that's going to take over from me? Why, wow, your neighbor is Jesus. He became neighbor to the human race when he took upon our, himself our flesh and our blood. 
And this is the situation with which we are all beginning now. And with others, because of our failure to submit, because of putting self on the throne, we have violated the terms of our appointment and we are rejected kings. And God's purpose is to take the kingdom from us and give it to a neighbor of ours, to the Lord Jesus. So then he does the ruling rather than us. I think we need to see this. You know, we love to extol the fact that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Yes, how lovely that is. But he's not only come to save us, he's not satisfied until he has supplanted us. And that's the process that begins with our first salvation. That from that moment, the Holy Spirit is working to overturn the rule of self and for Jesus to supplant us progressively. And therefore, he wants us to be willing for that process. He wants us to be willing to accept ourselves as rejected kings who by our failure have proved ourselves completely unqualified to be the father, the mother of that family, to hold down that child, to be that, that do that piece of Christian service. To you and our own mind. And his purpose is not to give self another chance, but to let another supplant self so that he does the ruling and that other is the Lord Jesus. Now, as this story told us, we don't want to do that. It was the last thing that Saul was willing to do to admit himself to be the rejected king and give place to another. And with us too, it's the last thing we really want to do to admit ourselves trapped and failures due to be replaced by another. Instead, although we may be saved, we are still insisting on trying to be king. And to this day, we may still, like Saul of old, be sitting at the head of the table. This is the reason why we never repent. This is the reason why we are so slow to admit failure. Because it means that we are no good. But if I am king, my image must be preserved. And I must try and be, appear to be right. And to admit I'm wrong is a mortal blow indeed. And so as we say, so with us. In spite of the fact we've had real experiences, doubtless of the grace of God, when it comes to the practice, self is sitting at the head of the table and we're still trying to be king, still trying to make a go of it, when God's already decided he's not interested in us making a go of it. He's got somebody else, other than us, better than us, who wants to take over from us. But deep down, the native thing for all of us is to resist any such process. Nothing must be allowed to happen which will touch the kingship of self in our lives. And I want to say self sitting at the head of the table is the basic sin from which all other sins spring. The central letter of the little word sin is I. And you can see that in every sin. The sin of pride that displays itself, that despises others, that makes us so suffer to others. It's simply that I am still sitting at the head of the table. That sin when we feel jealous and act under it and speak under it. When a mother is praised or does well, do you have an, a, a, a feeling of love? No, or not always. Because self is at the head of the table. And when I'm king, I don't want to see anybody else possible than me. And that's the reason why we can be so easily jealous. Resentment and bitterness toward others simply springs from me at the head of the table me trying to be king how dare he talk to me like that why in the world should he who are you anyway well we are something in our own estimation we don't read it out this way but the fact that we react to wrongs or slights as we do 
So who is at the head of the table? Well, it was Jesus. There wouldn't have been any such reaction, but they were sitting there, they said. Never been in some cases. They were saying, but it's us there. Our irritations, the things in the daily job, and oh, how quick we are, I speak for myself, my impatience, my irritation. And that shows who has taken the head of the table at that moment. It's not Jesus. It's me. In spite of the fact I may know that I've been judged at the cross, I'm still trying to be king, still trying to be a good Christian. He doesn't want to even our attempt to be good Christians. And that temper, what is that? What is it that makes you fly off like that sometimes? I mean, it's so at the head of the table. You don't like what's happened. Things must go away and you react accordingly. And even our grosser sins, the sins of impurity and shameful indulgence, they all spring from self at the head of the table. For that man at the head of the table says, Why shouldn't I? And so we see ourselves like so, sitting still at the head of the table. And if men of soul were sitting at the head of, his t- head of the table, I want you to notice in the passage we read, twice it says, and David's place was empty. Everybody else is there, I'm hearing. But his most popular general wasn't. Because he didn't dare. His life wasn't worth anything. Just as long as Saul was at the head of the table. And though Saul wanted him there just to put put on a good show, David knew he couldn't possibly take the risk. And you know, that's the result when I'm at the head of the table. David's place is empty. Pathetic. I'm running things. I'm the one. I may be even a Christian. What I'm doing at the head of the table may be in Christian things. But the one I'm supposed to be doing it for, his place is empty. He cannot sit at the table with a man like that. He's the right to ruler. And in, in, in acting and, re- and reacting as I am, I am in effect, though I may not realize it, resisting him. And I want to tell you I know what it is to be trying to do the Lord's work with David's place empty. What a terrible thing. Trying to serve him. Trying to to preach. But in my life, David's place empty. Indeed, this was a situation when the Bible first came to my own heart back in 37. I was an evangelist going up and down Britain. And God had been blessing me for many years, but then something went wrong, I didn't quite know, except that David's place was empty. And I was left to struggle on in my own strength. And I later discovered, God, it was because I had gone back to the head of the table. And Jesus' place was empty. Moreover, while Saul was at the head of the table, while Saul still was trying to be king, he and his country staggered on from one problem to another until he ended in final defeat before the Philistines and his country that he was trying to rule ravaged by. He himself slain on Mount Gilbert with his dear son Jonathan and his and, and, and dear brought to its lowest depths of humiliation because this man who God had rejected would insist on trying to go on being king and all the time did he get mad? there was one in his own kingdom God's appointed one who by the skill of his hands and the anointing of God would have brought that nation out from all its trouble but he wasn't permitted to do so because Saul was at the head of the table and so it is for us while I'm at the head of the table 
Well, I'm trying to run my Christian life. Well, I'm trying to run my life. I stagger on from problem to problem. Every step I seem to take is the wrong step and get the wrong reaction to other, other people. But I won't give in and I won't admit to tell you I'm going to get on doing it. And I only walk into more and more problems and I believe that's the case with some of us. You've gone from problem to problem and very often they are problems of human relationships. If you find people aren't nice and sweet to you you don't blame them and maybe they're reacting to something in you. And all the time there is God's appointed one to do that life the Lord Jesus but we never gave him a chance we never sent down the fear of incomplaint and passion of failure we never really re- re- repented of sulking on the throne we never handed over to him had we done so how different would have been the result but we didn't if only we could accept ourselves as failures and flops. If only we could see the source of our troubles. As one Michael Russ ready to take over. But he can't save him as we are, how shall we put it, broken in repentance. Then, in the ruins of the door, he could take over and be the ones what they may he can make all things new as someone has said Jesus not only forgives the messer but unmesses the mess but he must be on the throne to do it and all you could offer the not promises don't make any more promises any more consecrations just offer him the mess he didn't think he wanted, but he does. And like that pot of old, he can make out of that mild vessel another vessel. As seems good to the potter to make it. Make it. This is what makes Jesus famous. This is what gives him a name. Not the number of Christians, good Christians who can pat on the back. Because there are any good Christians who speak as good Christians to pat on the back. But the message he clears up. The man vessels he makes again. When at last the mess is given to him in penitence, and the man responsible at last willing to vacate the throne to the greater than David. Now there then is are our thoughts on that first story. Got it? The table of which Saul was head. And I'm looking to repeat how it is a picture of ourselves now we turn to that other passage which we read it's in 2 Samuel 9 the table of which ultimately David was head now this is a very different scene from before some years have passed since that first table from which David had to vacate himself David now is king over all Israel and he is sitting at the head of his own banqueting house so the man who gave him such a hard time has been slain in battle not by the hand of David who wouldn't lift up his hand against the Lord's anointed but by the hand of the Philistines Saul's house and lineage have been broken and his lands have been forfeited and his only remaining descendant is one called Mephibosheth a man who is a cripple lying on both his feet and who realizing that he belongs in his house that they opposed David was fearing lest he would be liquidated 
as possibly the only way remaining torment to the soul. And he was hiding in a place of no dread, the place of laying the bar. Now listen to this. One of the first acts of David, when at last God put him on the throne, was to show kindness to the one remaining descendant of the house of his bitterest enemy. And David said, Is there still any that is left of the house of Saul? What do you want to know that, David? For I know. It's usual when a new king comes on the throne, he liquidates all remaining tenants. Is there any left to the house of Saul? Oh, how different was his intention. That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And this chapter 9 is the story of one of the most moving acts of magnanimity you can read. You know when I read the story of this astonishing kindness that David showed to the house of him deserted? I sometimes get all soft on the inside. Magnanimous. That was the reason why David was called the man after God's own heart. Because you see, God's a magnanimous God. Relentless in dealing with you about your sin. Not letting you off the hook until at last you admit you're wrong. But once you do, showing a magnanimity that astonishes us. Churchill said that his philosophy was in peace, diplomacy, in war, relentlessness, in victory, magnanimity. And that was surely David. And David was magnanimous. And for that reason was called the man after God's own heart. The ours is a God who is magnanimous. To those who fought him, to those who resisted him, to those who have done to his son what Saul did to David. And once you and I had been broken in repentance and come to the foot of the cross and accept the fact without quibble that we are flops and failures and somebody else going to take over from us, the scene always changes. No longer Saul at the head of the table. God is. And he's there to show kindness to the very people who have given his son from their table. If there left any of the sons of Adam that I may show them kindness for Jesus' sake. The sons of Adam but they are the ones that put him on the put Jesus on the cross. I want to show them kindness for the sake of that the, that same one. And although you and I have given Jesus from our table, God has got a place for us at His. Indeed, there's a place there with your name on it. The name of the man who's lost his temper more than any other. The name of the woman who shouted at her children. The name of the young person who's been so rebellious. Although you and I have driven Jesus from our table and this place has been empty, grace has got a place for you and me at his table. This is the meaning and message of this story. Now David uh, said that uh, he says in verse 3 is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him so what I want to do is I want to show the kindness of God unto him David where in the world did you get that conception of God is God like that his enemies is God a magnanimous God well he said he has been to me 
Desire them. A shepherd them. Let grace, family, and sobering magnanimity that I never deserve. And I want to show the same great, big hearted kindness of God to somebody else who doesn't deserve it. So that was what David wanted to show. And this kindness of God of which David speaks is the same as what the New Testament calls the grace of God. The grace of God. The grace of God is the magnanimity of God toward those that don't deserve it. And the in conviction he's relentless, but the moment you break, there is nothing but grace, no humility. The more that I admit how well I am, I find myself on the receiving end of the grace of God. Indeed, my very love, when fully confessed, becomes my title to that grace. Because grace is, you know what grace is? Grace is different from love. When God loves the lovely, it's never called grace. Because that was something to deserve it. The love of God is only called the grace of God when the one upon whom it is bestowed doesn't deserve it. It's utterly terrible, completely wrong. And that love doesn't change. You see, the play more strongly for that one. And then we don't call it love. We call it grace. Love is grace. And I love it more. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. And this is what you become the recipient of when you admit yourself to be a Mephibosheth. A one utterly undeserving, completely wrong. If it be of grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. The moment you've got to deserve it, Grace is no more grace. But if somehow you can locate yourself as a flop, as a failure, as a Mephibosheth, lame on both your feet, never being able to keep your promises, never being able to make it, to, to make the standards required, once you can see yourself living in a spiritual low bar, a place of no satisfaction, and once you say, oh Jesus, that's what I am, that moment, you become a candidate for the grace of God. They're very moved, they're very failures. I, I can't tell you what this means to me. Makes me a candidate. Qualifies me for this wonderful grace that flows from Calvary. Isn't that terrific? This mighty, limitless grace of God that failing saints and sinners like And so it was, when they brought the physicians to him, he was all fearful, not knowing what was going to happen. And David said, fear not. And he said, him, said to him three things. One, I will surely show thee kindness. He didn't expect that. Me? Kindness? One of your opposing house? But I'm going to do it, he said, for Jonathan thy father's sake. Oh well, imagine if we all take me to the shepherd. There's nothing very attractive in me, nor in the history of the house. But your God and me, and I tell you. There's a time when he's my only friend. There's a time when he believed so sincerely in my victory that I doubted it. He said, You're going to be king, David. And David, I want you to make a promise that when you're king, and God's cut off all your enemies, you will spare my seed. Now that's a prophetic thing. He knows strongly. He was so certain of David's victory that he was still a fugitive. It wasn't David pleading with Jonathan, it was Jonathan pleading with David. David, make a pact. But whatever else happens, you will spare my seed. And David that day was mindful of that covenant made with Jonathan and for Jonathan's sake he was going to show him kindness and you know 
That's the ground of this place that's going to make all things new. It's going to change everything. It's going to bestow on you and me for Jesus' sake. All oh, this blessed covenant between Father and Son about you. You see, Jesus knew there was going to be a seed coming from him. He knew there was going to be those who would believe on him and trust themselves to him. And therefore he pleads with the Father, he makes a contact with the Father that God will spare them, will save them, save them, meet their every conceivable need. And I tell you, the grace that I received, the grace that's blotted out sin and made things new to me, has come to me for Jesus' sake. That's why God's done it. Because the sinless Savior died, my guilty soul is counted free, and God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And if you're going to be blessed tonight, some might be saved tonight, some brought out of this difficult situation the way they are saved, it's going to be for Jesus' sake. My little children, says John, I write unto you that your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Isn't that good? The fact that you aren't very much doesn't need to tell you. The fact that you aren't good enough doesn't bother you. It's going to be done for your sake, but for his sake. Jesus, the sinner's friend, we hide ourselves in thee. God looks upon thy sprinkled blood. It is our only plea. Our only plea. But will you notice what he went on to say? Not only am I going to show you kindness for thy father's sake, but I'm going to restore thee all the land of thy father. He taught him the lot. He was living as a pauper. Although those lands had once belonged to the family, of course, the glory of his soul had been taken away. But David is going to get a road back. And all the servants that belong to those lands. And this is what grace does. Yes, I'm forgiven. But more than that, he unmesses the mess. He restores what I've lost. And undoes the mess. And heals what I've broken, the relationships. I want to tell you, Jesus doesn't stop merely the forgiving of sins. If only he can get the, the rotten, mixed up situation into his hands, with a man who's in the middle of it, repenting, that mixed up situation is no problem with him at all. It's the raw material for a new purpose, and he'll restore all that we forfeited by our folly and make all things new. As I say, this is what makes Jesus famous. This is where he gets his name. Sometimes people come up to me with a big sort of very few minutes and say, oh, Mr. Hesham, I've got a problem. And I'm in my breath, I say, Hallelujah. <laughs> because I know that's the story that Jesus excels. Well, <laughs> he, he knows what to do. The people that know me, they should never come up and say they've got a problem. They're kidding themselves. They're blind. They're all, if you've got a problem, and if somehow you can see it isn't apart from that you've contributed to, to it by your own attitudes and sin and wrong. And you have. Well, I know the other person was wrong, but your reactions were wrong too, that only made the situation worse. If you can only see you've got a problem and you have capability in it, you qualify for the cross of Jesus. You qualify for the blood. You qualify for the expertise of the Son of God in restoring and undoing this is what makes him great. And he said, I think the third thing is going to happen to you, the finish is, your journey eat bread at my table continually as one of the king's sons. You're not going to be banished. You're going to be right in the capital. You're going to sit at my royal table. And although you may be lame on both your feet, don't you worry, Mr. Bishop, I'm not going to bother about that. You're going to be seated there for your father's sake, for Jonathan's sake. And there's a tablecloth, if they had such things in those days. And they'll hide all your deformity, and you'll feel completely at ease in my presence. And you know that's what Jesus does for souls 
to admit you're wrong, to look at his yes. He sits with his tongue. Now there I say again, we drove him from our table. He has a place for us, which means that he now is the host. If you have never had a table, you have a host, you've got to do the providing. And that's been the trouble, it's been too much for us, we haven't been able to make it. But if I can see that another sort of question lies, not me sitting at the table, with him sitting at my table, can I serve him? But me sitting at his table, and he's the host, then he does the providing. And I don't need to be a, be a thing to that table, except my hunger, except my need, except my emptiness. That's what Paul meant when he said, it's not I that live, but Christ lives in me. I'm no longer the host. He's no longer sitting at my table. I'm sitting at his. And he puts on the table all I need, and you'll find yourself possessed with a peace that isn't yours, and a joy that isn't yours, and a love for the other fellow that isn't yours. Or where did it all come from? It's not me. Yes, it isn't mine. You're sitting at his table. He's the host. And so, this is the offer of grace to the Who's at the head of the table? Are you at the head of the table? What an aesthetic mess you're making of it. The five days you never did an admission of failure. Did you get mad that the admission of abject failure is a first step in the victory where Jesus takes over. You're sitting at his table. With the fall of his covenant forgiven. And he now is the host. Yes, that's what we're talking about this morning, coming to the cross. Not going to the front door and asking for the positive air, give me more of this, but going to the back door and repenting of the negative. Lord, I've been proud, I've been resentful, I've been self-indulgent, I've thrown off the hand with I've been running my life, go there. And you're going to be treated with the same magnanimity as Mephibosheth was. My last thought is this. The last sentence of the story was that he was lame on both his feet. Sitting on the table, but lame on both his feet. Yes, he was always a man, but always sitting at the table. And you know, there's no great promise of the generation land over you, and we're going to start growing wings. You'll be impossible if you did. You're going to be a weak, Need a man to the rest of your days with no righteousness of your own, but you'd have the privilege of living at the cross. Living at that table of grace. Only up quickly to what you are, and all the time finding Jesus meeting it, and the blood of his, and, and his blood cleansing you. Isn't that beautiful? I'm perfectly as one in the I'm in the fiddleship. But I'm sitting at the same table that the fiddleship did. Oh, such a relief to feel you haven't got to keep up with the tense and any news with the other Christians. You just share what a Mephibosheth you are. But you also share what Jesus does for Mephibosheth. And they get so encouraged. They thought that you, you graduated. They discovered you haven't graduated at all. You're just at the cross and they can join you there. And maybe some of us ought to get there tonight. This evening. Perhaps there might be some for the first time, never really got peace with God. But the eyes of us have known something of that. Oh yes, we say we're so, but we've been on the throne. So, but the God knows how to bring that self to failure. And tonight we prepared not to wait, not to wait for any further painful experiences to prove that you're a failure. Why not take it on trust tonight? Why not take it on trust? I'll accept what God says about me in the flesh. No good thing. And tonight, we can go back to the cross and say, Jesus, you take over. That's what it is. It isn't Jesus helping you, it's him taking over as we bow and confess the whole truth to him now. Let's pray.